Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy, where we take philosophy, mix it with beer, and apply it to the questions you deal with every day. Welcome to Six Pack Philosophy. I'm Anastasia here with Mike and John, and this week, as per our uh, listener request, thank you, Thad, we are discussing alternative relationships. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, well, I guess a few weeks ago now, we did a show on uh, poly, poly, polygamy and monogamy, and it was requested that we take a look at some of the other alternative yeah, or yeah. the other relationship structures that uh, people engage in and kind of... Look at those the same way we did. Uh, still not getting this right. Polyamory. I keep, I keep trying to say polyamory, but the show we did was called Polygamy versus Monogamy. So Yeah, whatever. whatever. Anyway. Yeah, those things. But before we get into all that, what are we drinking, guys? We are drinking Oktoberfest. I'm Marzen Style Lager. Yeah. So, go ahead. It's from the <laughs> Odell Brewing Company in Fort Collins, Colorado. It's a 6.1 ABV. Anna's plotting not to let me talk at all today. She's really excited on. about this She's show. She's excited about this show. I was ex- as excited. Actually, I was about to talk about this beer. Um, I was excited to get this beer as I was to talk about it. Um, the Oktoberfest beers have just come out. So, they are about as fresh as they're going to be this year. Um, so when I saw this, this was actually the first of the Oktoberfest beers that I saw. Um, there were a handful on the shelf, but I went ahead and grabbed this one because it feels like it's been a while since we've had an Odell beer, and they tend to do all right. They do well. They uh, do they've well. got some really good ones. Um, so I grabbed an Oktoberfest to as early in the season as I could so that we could really get the best feel for what this Oktoberfest season is going to be all about. All I'm right. Hopeful, although I haven't even sniffed this beer yet. All right. So I want uh, everybody to be fully aware that that I am uh, I am very well prepared for the show. I have as always. I have had relationships before, so uh, that's the prep that I did for this one. I am. I, have you had I am any learning. alternative relationships? If I had any alternative relationships in my life, um, uh, I'm going to plead the fifth. Um. <laughs> <laughs> John and I found out this morning that we are in. A, an alternative relationship. Yes, yes, we are. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, we can just go ahead and, and die. Did, did, did the dog already know? What? I was, uh, no, it's I, about, I, did I, did it's about consent. Else? It's oh, about God. consent. Yeah. <laughs> Mike? Um, no, uh, in fact, we can go ahead and dive in. You know, I, I kind of want to structure this in, in, in two kind of segments. Um, one is going to deal with different types of what Westerners may, may view as marriages. Um, but then I want to kind of come back on the back end and do a whole section on arranged marriages because I think that's a more foreign concept to us and one that bears discussion. Uh, but yes. most of these are just going to deal with... Unless you're Amish. Well, there you go. There you go. But most of this is just going to deal foreign with... to most of us. And, and they're not listening to the show because they don't use technology. Well, maybe they're listening on a friend's radio. They can or, listen to, to... Or maybe they're a really bad practitioner of the Amish faith. Maybe somebody is driving by, blaring our podcast into Amish, Amish country. I encourage this. If you live in your Amish country, please drive by and blare this podcast. Maybe they're hiding out in the bar with their secret podcast. <laughs> I'd have yes, been a really bad secret. Amish person because that's, that's what I would have been. Hiding out, listening to like, I don't know, rock and roll music or something. But but on that, that range, uh, on, on that topic of we found out we were in an alternative relationship, the first one I want to talk about is something called a starter marriage. A starter marriage. I also found marriage. that called a sunset clause marriage. So well, I guess there's actually a little bit of a difference there, but we'll talk about that in a minute. Yes. Sorry. So starter marriage. So this is, this is an idea that, that's come about where um, people are entering into what you might consider a, a traditional marriage. But what they're doing, they're they're getting the license, they're they're doing all the steps, but in their vows, they're putting a date on it. And at this date, they get to decide if they want to continue the marriage. They're usually committing to not having kids for this period of time. Um, and it's just kind of a, we're going to try marriage, but maybe it's not for us. So so we get to taste it for a little bit, and, and there's no hard feelings at the end of this time period if it doesn't work out. I suspect there'd be hard feelings, but okay. Well, maybe. See, and when we got married, we said 70 years. So we're in a starter marriage. Now, there you go. There you go. A 70-year starter marriage. Yes, yes. Okay. So right. we, we haven't really, you know, I, I don't... I these, think you may be stretching the uh, definition a little <laughs> bit whenever you, you, you put it at 70 I mean, years. You know, maybe. I don't know how you can tell after two years. My hair's not even starting to gray. I don't know how she's going to feel after that. So we really need time. But after five, to, it is. Time, time. 
<laughs> it may come to that time when she has to change your diaper and she goes, no, no. Exactly. We're done. We're done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. But I committed to 70 years. See, and I think that you get an experience of the different ages that somebody is going to be and the different uh, life stages somebody's going to be in mm-hmm. over 70 years that you don't get in five or and ten. And at the end of it, you can get your permanent marriage for, you know, a month Three. and a half. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then die. Yeah. So uh, sunset clause marriages are very similar to that. Um, but <coughs> more along the lines of they seem to be uh, typically shorter time frames of we're going to reevaluate every two years whether or not we want to continue to be married. I've, I've seen them stretch as, as long as about 10 years, um, but it's just kind of, we're not committing to this for life, We're gonna, but we are going to commit for a specific period of time um, and just reevaluate periodically. Okay. So it's kind of an ongoing starter marriage. Yeah. So what do you think about this? Is starter marriage a good idea for, for, for people you know trying to figure it out? Uh, I I don't know I don't I, I don't see a lot of difference between that and shacking up except you've got a contract involved. Yeah. Uh, I uh, to me marriage is something where where you're making a, a uh, you know you're, you're making a lifelong commitment. Uh, now we know in the modern era that marriages don't last, uh, but there there's already a way out. So I don't I don't know. Yeah. It seems strange to me. It seems strange to me. Well, and one of the things that I actually kind of like about the idea of the sunset clause marriage is though you don't have this theoretical assurance of security for life, you can say, okay, even if we're not happy, we know that we've committed to this for the next two years. And so if you've decided that you don't want to move on, you know you've got a year to kind of get your affairs in order and find a way that you can split everything up. You you mentioned something interesting, so I'm actually going to skip down a few and come back. Um, So you said, you know, it's a lifelong commitment, but there's already a way out, so you don't really see the point. So I want to kind of go on the other side of the spectrum and talk about a covenant marriage. Okay. So a covenant marriage uh, is actually a legal thing that I was not aware of, but apparently it exists in some states. And it's basically a super marriage. Uh, They usually... um, have more stringent vows um but one of the big things is if they want a divorce they have to prove that they'd and i'm reading off here one that they've done everything possible to repair the marriage and two meet certain legal requirements and if they can't meet those requirements they have to wait two years before divorcing wow so they are legally bound together without any quick escape. I wonder if that would hold up in court, though. I I, I suspect it wouldn't. It, it, uh, well, apparently it's a legal institution in some states, so yeah. it's I it's how long in that's law. Been around. Did you find that? Uh, you know, I would imagine it's it's a much older institution, but I, I don't know. Well, what would happen if you know if if both parties that entered into this uh, this contract decided uh, not to you know. Not, not, not to test it. Just, just do they still have to go through that, or can you break it if through mutual consent? I mean, you've got two know. parties there, and traditionally, a, a contract can be broken if both yeah. parties agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, as we know through through uh, some legal text, uh, aka uh, Hollywood. Um, <laughs> Okay. There, there are certain times when courts can come through and and put you know requirements on on the divorce, like you have to go. See, I, I'm thinking right now of uh, uh, what was the movie where they got married in Vegas and won the money, and they weren't going to get the money unless that they. No, I don't remember. A- anyway, that. but but you know he, he made him go through you know six months of marriage counseling before. If you he, talk about movies after 1968, I I don't know really. Right. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of an old school movie guy. That was past guy. his teenage years. But before but, I was born. But uh, what? Keep it up. Keep okay. it up. <laughs> I'm not that damn old. I'm close. I'm close, but I'm not that old. Well, we, we've seen courts. Uh, I, I saw a case here about four months back, and th- this wasn't a movie. This was in the news um, where a couple had slept together, had a baby, and they were trying to split up their affairs, and they, they started arguing in the courtroom, and the judge ordered them to marry or he was going to take the kid away from both of them. Yeah. And so we've seen where judges have ordered people to marry. Yeah, that's an asshole. Yeah, I that's mean, I agree. Judge. I agree. I, I, but before we get on, I have a, I have a complaint. Um, mm-hmm. I'm look over here looking at the at the video right now as we're doing this, and uh, it is becoming incredibly obvious to me that I need to do sit ups. I'm, I'm not, I'm not pleased with how I look on the video. 
can fix you fix your posture? Can, can you slim me down or something on the on in the yeah. editing? Yeah. Oh yeah. I All can. Right. I yeah. can definitely. I can I gotta, definitely do I that. I can strap a like broomstick. No, you're not to your strapping back. on anything, okay? There will be no <laughs> strapping on. We're not in that kind of alternative relationship. I can attach a broomstick to your back so you'll actually sit up straight. Oh Lord, <laughs> Mr. Producer, make sure that you uh, slim this yeah. area right here. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyway, I need to keep my girlish figure. I'm sorry. There I was a reason we started no, this fine. as a podcast audio. <laughs> So uh, the next one, I'm, I'm going back up the list here, uh, is a companionship marriage. And, oh, there you go. Hey, you fixed it yourself. <laughs> now hey, just hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> I see the $500 uh, uh, patrons coming oh right on Lord, after that. I'm telling you, I'm yeah. telling you. <sighs> um, so next up is a companionship marriage. And uh, basically, this lacks a lot of the features of many marriages. Usually, it's not people trying to have kids. Usually, it's not people who are involved with each other, at least as much romantically, if at all. Um, it's just someone who wants someone to be around and be a companion. A lot of times, we see this with, with older widows and widowers. Uh, they're in their, their golden years. They're not pursuing a lot of the traditional things you would in a marriage, but they would like someone around the house. So, you know, two older people kind of get married and, and they just want some companionship. There's something kind of romantic about that, though. I, 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 can, I can definitely respect that. I've, um, I, I've seen a lot of cases of that. Uh, you know, second marriage, third marriages, you know, mm -hmm. or widows. Uh, it would seem like that would be relatable to people in the sense of, the movie trope of like if we're not both married by we're by the time we're forty we'll just get married and it's like forty's too young <laughs> whatever uh, way too young if we're way, not married way. by the time we're twenty one we're just gonna <laughs> we're gonna you know well I've seen uh, some younger than that. if we're not married the, by the time we're thirty like chill your life hasn't you started just yet at started 30. figuring out who you are at thirty uh, but um but it, it would seem like that would be similar to kind of what they're describing here yeah. Only I kind of like that one though. That's that's uh, that, that's interesting to me. It's, you know, I've made the joke before that uh, that you know if I had to take care of myself, I'd be drunk in a ditch pa uh, with no electricity. Uh, maybe companionship marriage is the way to take care of that. Yeah. So or I'm maybe taking counseling. Uh, <laughs> maybe counseling. Maybe. Uh, uh, I'm taking applications now for that day whenever somebody wants to take Life care courses. of me and, and, and pay my bills. Uh, can, you're going to go they? ahead and accept applications for when Marcy dies. Yes, yes. I, we're, then we're, then you'll well, already have them in, in I don't. Stock. I don't want to be just left. So, yeah. <laughs> can, I want to be able to jump right into this. Can they go ahead now and get a, a reference from, from uh, uh, Marcy so they know what to expect? Uh, no, and you're no. not like, turning oh, that's references? A good idea. That's, that's a bad idea. Yeah. We, bad can, idea. we can kennel you until you find your, your companionship marriage. That's a bad idea because I'm an asshole to live with. Um, oh, no. I said kennel. Shh. <laughs> you're not allowed to speak. <laughs> Bet. Women. Like children should be seen and not heard. Be quiet or I'll shove your dick in your mouth. <laughs> Yeah. If I could do that, I'd never leave the house. <laughs> I'll help. It's fine. <laughs> oh, this well, show went south quick. On the other side of the spectrum from companionship marriages uh, is parenting marriages. So this is when two That's what you need. <laughs> no. No, it's not. You are wrong. <laughs> this is um, when two people get together for the primary purpose of raising children. Oh, not so, what I thought it was. <laughs> sometimes in these parenting marriages, yeah. you'll even see people whose sexualities aren't compatible. So maybe a gay woman and a gay man, but they both want kids, so they'll get together yeah. just for the purpose. They want to procreate and raise children. Yeah, uh, I've, I've seen cases of this. I've known people that, yeah. that have done this, that uh, you know, they're, they're not interested at all sexual, but it's, it's, it's convenient. They meet yeah. each other's economic needs and... Uh, Social needs, yeah. Yeah, we have some friends who could fall, it could be kind of a hybrid of this and the companionship marriage. Yeah, they could be, and, and I think they could probably fall into this next category. You know what I find most amazing about that statement is that you have friends. I understand. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, nobody in this room. But. <laughs> right. Yeah. We can't stand each other. But, um, oh, so next we have, this one was actually a little more interesting to me. Living alone together marriages. And this is when two people, they don't want to live with anybody. They may have houses separate, maybe due to career changes, or maybe they just don't uh, want to give up that space. But they get married and just live apart. They see each other from time to time, maybe go over to each other's houses. Living alone Oh, you're together. thinking of someone different then. Okay. Living alone. So, so I, I, it doesn't sound like it would be what it's calling. 
it sounds like it would be two people living in the same house but having their own lives yeah so that's kind of so, what i imagine so it's not that. It's, it's actually living separate yeah you know maybe you could stretch it and get a duplex yeah i don't know but uh but yeah it's people who live in in separate spaces i, uh, I understand the want for that yeah i I, <laughs> I was not making a joke i'm sorry i know someone whose whose family does this they're uh the, uh, the 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 mother lives stateside and the father lives uh, Indonesia, I think. Oh, and that's they've been separate for that's a about decade as or so. A part as you can get. They come together uh, about once a year and visit, and then they move on. Really? Um, yeah. and, and they're married. Yeah, yeah. It's oh, an economic okay. decision, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, interesting. Interesting stuff. You know, and, and this is a weird one to me because within my own marriage, I can say. It would be odd to me to spend what would at least I perceive to be that little amount of time with my partner. I could I could date and do that. So uh, it, it's a little bit of a confusing idea to me to marry behind this. And then I, I have questions about why take that step into marriage? Why not just perpetually date them and maybe even uh, uh, exclusively date them, you know? Yeah. Um, well, and what I wonder is if I would actually be really interested to know if marriages that fall into that category are more likely to start out where they have separate uh, living spaces and they choose not to merge or they merged at one point, realized they liked each other, but they didn't like living together and wanted to stay together, but got separate homes. I could see that really easily. Happening. Yeah, I could see that. Actually. I, um, I- you know, I, I look at that and I go, you know, I, I, I could I could deal with that. I could deal with having my own place and right? and that stuff. Yeah, I mean. Well, well, and how little togetherness is required to fall under this. For instance, if you're a truck driver and you're rarely at the house, is that kind of under? Oil filled. Yeah, oil yeah. filled or, or whatever. Or is that something different because you do own a combined home? Yeah. Yeah, but you also have a like off-premises off premise yeah. home. Yeah. 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 That'd be interesting. Uh, I think it kind of qualifies. Yeah. I think so. I think so. That's a, uh, uh, I think this is probably more common than we, than, than we realize. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. and I, I think I, a lot of these are, I, I, I think, um, you know, it, it, it was like the show we did on, on kinks and the, the show. thing we found. Yeah, it was, it was I forgot uh, what it was called, but it was a good show. Paraf- Paraphilia. 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 Yeah, yeah. Um, but Check the thing we out, found guys. is that like something crazy, like 70% of people have a paraphilia, but each one has a different one so that no paraphilia takes over the majority. Yeah. So I think probably most people that listen to this are going to in some way identify with one of these we talk about. And then they're going to think. I have a bunch of paraphilias. I'm yeah. just playing. But then they're going to think all the other ones are weird. You yeah. know what I'm saying? And and, and I, I think I think these the al- other is always weird. Yeah, I think these alternative relationships may not be as alternative as we we think they are. Uh, we just only identify with two out of this, you know, thirty. Right. You know. Yeah. 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 Um, next we have what's called a safety marriage, and and this tends to fall under two categories. One is physical, and the other is economic. But it's more or less a marriage that mostly revolves around benefit. Maybe they have a lot of wealth, and there is economic safety that comes into yeah, it. Yeah, uh, and and I think this was a a, a version of marriage that was very common uh, in, in, in earlier time periods mm-hmm. uh, where, where you marry someone because they provide a, an economic or sometimes even a physical safety net. You're yeah. in trouble and you need somebody to defend you. Um, but uh, I think as society has become safer, we've probably seen less of this. Yeah. And y- 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 yeah, y- no, y- I, I agree right? completely. No, I do. I, I was thinking about it. But yeah, no, I think, I think very few people these days worry about, you know, the armies invading and burning down the town. There's very little chance that the Indians them, are going to attack now. Starving to death in a bad winter, you know, whatever yeah. it is. And so I think, yeah, we, we've seen a shift. However, if the Indians ever get pissed off, you know. They have casino money. They, they could do it. They have casino money. We could be in trouble. Yeah. Oklahoma is done. Yes. There are yeah. also like 1,200 of them. But there's 1,200 casinos in Oklahoma. That's probably not true. But probably there's, close. there's a lot of casinos in Oklahoma. Yeah. They have a lot of money. Yeah. 1,200 people with enough money could be dangerous. Listen, they may not kill you, but do you we never want... We see that in wa- Congress. Uh, 
They may not kill you, but do you never want to win a slots game again? I want you to think yeah. really hard about that. I've never won a slots game. You've See? never won at slots? No, but I've, I've also barely played. I've won at slots, but I've never won more than I've lost. How's that? Then you've never won. I've, I've won and then put it back in. I've never won in the long run. No, right. I've wa- I, now in the long run, I've definitely lost on slots. Yeah. But I have walked out with more money than I walked in with on a slots game. In fact, I remember one. We were going down. We were we were going to be playing roulette, and the roulette tables hadn't opened. So I sat down on a slot machine. I put in like I don't know thirty bucks. I won four hundred, and then we took that over to the uh, roulette table and lost it. Well, they got their money anyway. Yeah, I always tell it everybody. It was a different casino, so it doesn't count. <laughs> I always tell everybody those big those big casinos weren't built because people win. Yeah, yeah exactly, uh, exactly. Yeah, uh, interesting though. Interesting. All right. Uh, next up, and I don't want to talk about this too heavily because we did a whole show on it, and they can go listen to uh, polygamy versus monogamy. Um, but I do want to touch on it and then maybe see, um, maybe do a review on it since we have done a show on yeah, it and yeah. see if any. Any updates to that? Uh, open marriages. Yeah. I think there's a broad category of this. From, pretty common. Yeah. Pretty common. Uh, a lot more common than we think it is because it's it, it's still underground and people aren't claiming it. They're not bragging about it, but it's a... Uh, well, and it seems it can to... can ruin your fucking career. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it can ruin everything. Yeah. Well, yeah. And it seems to be somewhat uh, uh, on the rise in the 20 to 30 area. Um I, I don't know From that it is. From the research that I've, I've I seen. I don't know that it is. I think it's always been big in the 20 to 30 area. I think there's a lot of 20 to 30-year-olds right now. Okay. Well, um, there's that, but I think there's probably... I think one of the reasons that there is at least a perceived increase is I think there's actually a shame shift it's in, more accepted. in our generation um, where a lot of the things that our parents' generation and our parents' parents' generation was... Thank you, Mike. Um, <laughs> I like to wrestle with my microphone. I was pointing at my beer saying that we need to judge this because I'm about to finish it, and I ran into my microphone. Yeah. But um, I'm an idiot. Things that our parents' generation and our parents' parents' generation were taught to be ashamed of, we've kind of thrown out the window and said, why are we actually being well, ashamed of that? That's true, and there's also a change in media where uh, media censorship of these things Things are not as as uh, abundant as they once were. Also true. So we see it more. Yeah. Uh, which I think is it's because of you know, as society accepts things, the media accepts it more. Right. Uh, but I, I, it's it's more apparent to us now. Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I think I think thirty years ago, people would say I don't know anybody like that. Yeah. Today you say I, I know a bunch of people like that. I don't yeah. think there's more people. I think we just know about it. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, and, 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 you know, it's it's also changed in how we look at it. For instance, uh, there was a time way back, probably when you were a kid, uh, when nobles would would regularly <laughs> engage in this behavior, but but peasants weren't. And, and, and you know... Oh, the good old days. It wasn't considered even when the king had uh, harems, polyamory then, it was just the, the king and his harems. It, it wasn't, a, you know... The king screwing somebody. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. as kings do, yeah, you yeah. know. Good to they be weren't king. family, so they weren't a wife, right? Yeah. So, God damn. <laughs> it's good to be king. What can I say? What would you know about that? I, I have always said that democracy is highly overrated, that a king would be a much more effective and efficient government so long as I'm king. Right? I, I think we all think that. I know you're. That, I agree. We all think that so long as I am king, things would be better. I know. I know you're pointing out the beer. There's actually one more on this list okay. before we get to a range. So you think we've got time for yeah, one more? Yeah, yeah, Okay. This next one I found real interesting. Actually, I'm going to put in the description a whole TED Talk that you can go watch after you finish this show. After. After. Um, and it was about uh, an asexual woman. Um, but she kind of talked about her relationship experience. Um, so I, 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 it was kind of not fitting any of this. She had a friend who she really started to like. So asexuality, I guess, uh, you know, for anyone who's not aware, is someone who doesn't find themselves attracted to anybody. They're just not interested in sex. Yeah, not at all. Which is a growing movement. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or appears to be. Yeah. And she found with with herself that she was wanting a relationship. She was wanting to be with somebody. But on the other hand, she wasn't sure how to accommodate that. If she got with someone who wasn't asexual... They would definitely want sex. So how do you do that? Do you outs- She talked about outsourcing it. 
um, maybe having an open relationship where, where a partner could go have sex with other people. Sure, sure. Uh, she also talks about maybe finding another asexual, but that really kind of limits her on what she can do. Um, and her her solution was she found this this other girl she really liked hanging out with, uh, her best friend, and she decided that she wanted to live with them, have like a roommate situation. She didn't want any kids, but they could raise a dog together. And just hang out with that person for the rest of their lives. So it's kind of like this companionship marriage, but it's a little bit different because traditionally in companionship marriages, we see that because uh, of of the time in their life. And and this is is somewhat different in that it is structured during prime reproductive place in your life around, I just like hanging out with people and this is a person that's less asshole than other people. I had a... uh, I had a family member. I'm not gonna not gonna say how she's related to me because it would embarrass my my family. She she's passed on now, but I remember as a kid, uh, she, her uh, she and her husband had this relationship where he had a he had a girlfriend. Everybody knew he had a girlfriend, and and, and the whole family went went to her and said, "Hey, such and such is, you know, he's got a girlfriend. He's he's public with her." And her statement to the family was that that. That, that that just kept him satisfied, and she didn't care. If she, they, they were they were perfectly satisfied that they never had any children. They were best friends. They were married. They lived together. Everything was fine. Uh, when he passed away, she was uh, you know she cried at the funeral. Everything was was there, uh, but just there was no sexual desire there, and she was fine with it. Uh, and this was this was in the seventies, yeah. uh, you know, wow. and, and and she was she was probably in her <coughs> you know in her seventies then. So mm-hmm. it's something that's been around for a while. Oh yeah. Uh, just um, Good and, and for them. they were a little more open about it than others. Uh, yeah. They were the weirdos in our family, though. Just so you know, uh, those are always really? the funnest people, aren't they? They were the weirdos. Uh, well, I was very, very young then. Um, okay. They were the weirdos in the family. Uh, I loved did them. Did they? Did I they blaze very, a trail for you? I was very close with uh, with, with them. They were. Uh, I, so I, yes. I'd go spend some time with them. Yeah. Yeah. Good people. All right. That kind of, and I'm sure there's there's. Mm. Millions of others that I, I, I'm not mentioning here, but that was kind of the the bits and pieces I wanted to touch on traditional marriages before we get into arranged marriages. Can we call but it traditional-ish, Western. We just call it marriage. Mm, no. Self-determined marriage. Okay, whatever. I don't know. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But it doesn't fucking matter. All right, let's talk about this beer. All what right. are we drinking, John? We are drinking Oktoberfest. And this is the Odell Brewing Company, uh, Fort Collins, Colorado, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, 6.1% ABV. Yes. Who would like to start this one? Um, I've finished mine. Y'all want me to start it? Yeah. Uh, it's been a, probably been a couple of weeks since I have. Um, let me get a, get a, get a quick, quick drink here. Um, I don't think it's a bad beer. I like Odell. Uh, I, I, it, it's definitely a light beer, but it's not so light that, uh, uh, that, that, it's, that it's watery. It doesn't feel like an Oktoberfest beer to me. I when I look for an Oktoberfest beer, I'm looking for something with a lot more spices in it. That's what I, I kind of expect. And while there is a hint of spices in this, there's not a lot. So I'm in a weird place with this. Where if I was ranking this as just any beer, I think I would rank it a, a, a above a benchmark. I would rank it probably like a two eight. But I'm ranking this as an Oktoberfest beer, and I think it misses the mark as an Oktoberfest beer. So I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go two one. All right, I want to go next because because I, I want Anna to break this up. Yeah, yeah. Whenever we're done, uh, I'll go ahead and, and put my rating out front. I'm giving it a three. Um, so I, I'm kind of coming up from the other side. Uh, it talks about itself being a Marzen style lager. Um, but it calls itself an Oktoberfest beer. Well, it says Mar- well, Oktoberfest. Marzen beers typically are served at Oktoberfest. Yeah, but they, but they tend to have a lot more spice than this, at least in my experience. Yeah. So with that, um, I think this is a great lager. I think it's got a great profile. I think it's got complexity without being overwhelming, which a lager is, is kind of got uh, uh, more subtle flavors to it. Um, it's definitely, you know, you could hand me this and I would not confuse it, confuse it with an American industrial lager at all. No, not it's, at all. It's its own beer. It's a good beer. It is. I th- it's a great lager. So I'm, I'm going to give it a three. Okay. So we all have right. a two, one and a three. And now Anna comes in with the completely fucked up rating that's going to screw us all over. So. <laughs> She's got a smile on her face. Um. I really like this beer. It has kind of an oaky taste to it. Um, 
some people are going to get this and some people won't. It has a very red taste to it. On the back end. Yeah, yeah. I would agree with I think that. It has a slight red, yeah. yeah. Um, it's kind of medium body. It's got a good mouth feel. Um, you think it's got a good mouth feel? I think it does. I think it's thin, but okay. It is, but it's supposed to be kind of thin. It's not as a, be as a logger. As, as a logger, it's supposed to be thin. As an Oktoberfest, yeah. I think it should be heavier. Well, um, I think this is a good early fall beer. Um, when it's still a little bit warm, it's not so heavy that it's going to make you feel weighed down or lethargic. Um, but when it starts cooling off just a little bit, um, I think this is going to be a really good transition beer. Okay. Early fall. Yeah, I, I can you know, agree with that. Transition to cooler weather. Um, I like it a lot. And with that, I'm giving it a 3.2. Really? Yes. Okay. Came I think over it's both fantastic. of us. I, I, I would say that. Uh, and that I wrote my rating down like before either of y'all actually came I would came say in. that what this beer suffers from is uh, is bad identification, okay? I don't think it's a bad beer, but I, I'm, if I'm trying to judge it as what it is, uh, I don't think it's what it claims to be. Now, that's because I've drinking a lot of Oktoberfest beers, and I tend to, tend to want something a little heavier, a little spicier. That's what I think of when I think of Oktoberfest. Uh, more of a German-style beer, and, yeah. and this just isn't it. Okay. Uh, Really good beer. I think if they released it as anything but an, I said, it would have been a 2.8 if I was just rating it as a regular right. beer. So, uh, yeah, yeah, good beer. Hey, let's talk about this can a little bit because that's part of the experience. I think it's a cool can. Oh, yeah. Odell so this has is a great, great artistry, yeah, yeah. just generally. And that, that, that is part of the experience. Yeah. So uh, I think this is a good beer. I think people should try it. Uh, yeah, please, drink please it. You'll enjoy it, I think. Don't, don't take my, my lower rating as a... Um, as, as a big down, slap in the face that don't it ever is. buy this. Yeah. Mike gave it a two one. Yeah. It's terrible. Yeah, two one based on what it claims to be. All right, fair enough. So fair uh, enough. that's kind of kind of where we are. If we were to go with just straight beer, we're all right in the same ballpark. Yeah. Two eight yeah. three three two. You know, we're right there. So. I think it's game time. Uh, yeah, yeah, game right. time. Uh, what's what's the name of our game? Uh, fuck date lawnmower. Fuck date lawnmower. So, and I, I think this gets you a couple of steps. Uh, Toward sealing the deal. Toward getting laid. Um, this is not such a fantastic beer that is actually going to get you laid. But uh, when you break this out, it's it's got a mellow enough flavor um, that I think it can be enjoyed by a wide range of people. Um, and, and not just tolerated, but actually enjoyed. Because it does have a pleasant flavor to it. It's not overly carbonated, but it's also not super flat. Um, and so I think if you break this out for just about anybody, um, except for maybe your extreme, I hate beer people, um, I think they're going to appreciate this and have a good time with it. Okay. First date beer. And I've, I've talked about in the past and I'll, I'll mention it here for anyone who, who doesn't listen to the show regularly. Uh, two types of first date beers. There's your Hail Mary beer. That's the, she's out of my league, but I'm going to throw some up here and, and, and hope it sticks. Uh, this is not your Hail Mary beer. This is your uh, regular first date. Now, I, I'm putting it there for a couple reasons. One, because it is light enough. If she's not a big craft beer person. I think it's a safe beer. It's a, it's a safe transition. Uh, it's got some complexity. Uh, it's not going to overwhelm the conversation, but I, I think it's something that you can go to if there's a lull in the conversation. Um, and I think it's probably something that most people you meet won't have had so it's it's something new for them to try so i'm i'm, I'm putting this out of first state beer first state beer okay uh yeah this is a lawnmower beer i think i could mow the lawn while i was drinking this it's good it's, it's refreshing it's not something that's gonna gonna make you feel weighted down when you're mowing so yeah this is a this is a good summer lawnmower beer too although it's got the fall flavors to it yeah it's gonna I, be one of the last yeah, mows yeah, of the year one of the last mows of the year i think you're good for this uh <laughs> and at 6.1 percent you're gonna enjoy yourself while you're mowing the lawn yeah. so you know yeah yeah so um good beer yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You'll give it a shot. You'll give it a shot. All right, John, I think you wanted to move us into something that's going to fuck my world up, didn't you? Yep. Arranged marriages. Arranged marriages. So the idea here with an arranged marriage is, <clears throat> unlike we're used to seeing where you go out on your own, you meet the right person, you fall in love, maybe you, you have some reason that you want to, excuse me, this the, the carbonation is getting me here, that you want to spend your, your life with them. Um, you actually, in this situation, are kind of 
prompted into a marriage. Uh, this is sometimes done by a family member, maybe a father, uh, or can maybe be a matchmaker. Can be a matchmaker. Yeah, that's where I was going. Also, it could be outsourced to to another person. Um, what if they just hit you over the head and drag you off somewhere? Can be done by your priest or your uh, religious leader. Yep, absolutely. Uh, it could be done done by the club. Could be uh, Matt Lauer locking the door behind you. No, I think that's a uh, uh, Weinman. Right, right, that's right, right. I'm yeah. sorry, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, what was his name? Wein- Harry Weinstein. 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 Yeah, that's that's a Weinstein marriage. It's a little different. Weinstein. Weinstein. Uh, we'll call him Weinstein just because that is the mispronunciation. Yeah. Weinstein. I Weinstein. Think, yeah. Yeah. I corrected myself. No, don't. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Shut up. What? Women. What the fuck is what, wrong with what, you? What did I tell you about not we'll speaking? We'll talk about this later. You are not to speak. Man. Oh, she's over there steaming now. Woo. Okay. So anyway. John, don't so, you train her better than that? Obviously not. So anyway. <laughs> um, I won't be on the show next week. She's going to strangle me to death when we're done. You can do it on camera. We'll get more views that way. Anyway, arranged marriages. Um, he hasn't crossed the line of nap violation yet. <laughs> but he's getting close. <laughs> So with arranged marriages, I, I kind of want to start with, with, you know, what is your perception coming into this? Is it a better system? Is it a worse system? What are the problems? Is it is it okay to to have your marriages arranged as you come into a marriage age? I uh, think it's a bad system. I think it's uh, I, I think in the modern era, at least, it's a system that is uh, uh, that, that's archaic, uh, that, that, that violates free will. Very, very bad system. Uh, Boy, I used the word very twice there. Here, let Uh, me disagree with Mike real quick. Shut up. But in the traditional system, I think it it, it served a purpose. It served a purpose. And sometimes that purpose was preserving family wealth. Um, And in a time period when it was much more dangerous to live, I understand why it happened. I get it. I don't think in the modern era it does. I don't think that it works for everybody. However, I can see some upsides to it. Uh, For one thing... A lot of people get married relatively young, in their 20s. Um, that is when the majority of people even still get married. Even in an age where people are getting married later and later, still, as of 2014, uh, 55% of 30-year-olds are already married. So the majority of us are married by the time we're 30. But that's also, um, with our development taking longer and longer, um, you're still at a point in your life where you don't really know yourself. You don't really know what it is that you... Um, maybe your long-term goals are and things like that. So I can see some reasoning there, uh, looking to maybe people who know you better, um, people who are more established in their lives, understand the sorts of things that actually make for a good marriage, um, being able to evaluate potential mates for you and, and ev- evaluate you as well and match you up with somebody that's going to be compatible with really? you. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Well, and you know, one of the one of the hardest things about picking a partner, right? Uh, whenever you're you're I'm so disappointed in you right now. Why? Be, be, because you just violated like like everything about the idea of personal responsibility no. and personal choice and free will with this. Now Free will with my Nobody's surprise being, with. I'm not talking about people being forced into it. I'm talking about people... You're talking about arranged marriage where somebody's and? telling you who you have to marry. No, I'm talking about people actively consenting to this process of saying, I want you to pick somebody for me. It's it, not much different than I, going on OkCupid. Okay I, 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 I think if you consent to it, it's no longer an arranged marriage. Right. But that's, that's, that's a definition thing. Well, you know, and one of the hardest things about finding a partner is whenever you're out considering whether you should take your relationship to the next step with whoever that is, you're usually horny, right? And you're not necessarily... <laughs> <laughs> that look. Oh, Thank Lord. you. Oh. That was great. You're not necessarily in the best frame of mind. Here's to... my question. When are you not usually horny? When you're trying to pick a mate. When you're unusually horny. <laughs> yeah. But, but when you're unusually horny, yeah. There you when go. you're trying to pick a, a, a husband for your daughter, you're probably not. Not. No. Yeah. No. No. <laughs> no. I'm going for a priest. That doesn't necessarily work out. She's female. It's okay. Yeah. Um, but but so, <laughs> so I, you know. Wouldn't you rather pick her, like, long-term partner? Would I rather? <laughs> yes. But yes. Do I think it's right? No. Okay. All right. So a lot of things I would rather do that I don't think is correct. 
Fair point. So, you know, it, it does introduce the, the, the problem, you know, trying to navigate the forest while you're standing in it versus, you know, a 10,000 foot view. Uh, now, all that said, this isn't necessarily advocating that that's the best thing. I think one of the reasons for the culture shift uh, away from, from arranged marriages uh, actually has less to do with a, a effectiveness or efficiency. Because as we can see, in non-arranged marriages, you still have a 50% divorce rate, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I think arranged it has... Arranged marriages actually stay together for life more frequently. That's because people that agree to an arranged marriage have no backbone usually. Oh, they usually. agree to arranged marriages some, so it's not well, forced? Well, we're talking about a situation here in a time period when arranged marriages were big where you didn't have a lot of choice. There wasn't divorce. Divorce didn't happen. No, I'm talking about part. now because arranged marriages still happen. They do still happen, and they, they happen in cultures where that, that's accepted more. And I'm fine for, for the cultural aspect of it. But I am not fine saying that this is a good system. <coughs> I think it's a bad system. I think it's a bad system. Well, I mean, who would who would you like to arrange yours? I want you to think for a minute. Uh, do you, are you going to go to your priest? Well, you don't have one of those. Are you going to go to your parents? Uh, you want them to pick your pick who you're going to marry? I have a couple of people that I think I could I could put that in their hands. Really? Yeah. Am I one of? Them? No. Okay. Hell no. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Well, I think I think asking the question, "Who would you like to arrange yours?" Uh, doesn't necessarily defeat the argument. For instance, yeah. right? We we could say. Well, and I specifically said, I don't think it's right for everybody. I agree, I, I, and I, I can accept there are people that that are there. I just don't think it's a good system. I think some people may. There's a lot of th- things that I don't think are good, but I think they work for some people. Yeah, okay. doesn't make them good. Yeah. So so my 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 question would be, you know. If we look at it and we look at the fact that non-arranged marriages get divorced at a rate of 50%, um, are non-arranged marriages any better? And I think the big reason that that we've shifted toward non-arranged marriages is not actually because it's a more effective system. I think it actually has to do with blame. Because let's even look at a world where arranged marriages had a 50% divorce rate. I think those 50% who divorced would then feel like they could look at whoever their arranger was and say, well, this is your fault it happened because you arranged this marriage. Even if they would have still had a 50% chance of divorcing, at least now they have to say, oh, wait, that was, I did that. Yeah. I, I kind of screwed the pooch on that one. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I can understand that. I can get that. I still think, I still think Anna's batshit crazy, but I can agree with that. Yeah. I mean, don't roll your eyes at me. What is wrong with you today? Man. I just You are completely delusional. I cut my eyes at you. <laughs> I just I think if you if you if you're making the argument, and I don't know that you are, but if you're making I know the, because it, you don't listen. That's true. Uh, if you're making the argument that arranged marriages have uh, have a better chance or even an even chance of success to, to uh, un- non arranged marriages, I think you have to say that's a cultural reason. Because people that, that are involved in arranged marriages tend to be from cultures that don't accept dissolution of marriage. Well, you know, let me ask. <coughs> does that so make sense? The, yeah, yeah, it, it does. And, and we're t- largely talking about India right now. I mean, that's that's the biggest. In, yeah, yeah, the biggest uh, modern, modern, yeah. yeah. Um, do they, see, I wonder where the fact that they didn't accept divorces. Well, they, no, 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 no. Legally, they do. But culturally, they do not. Does that make sense? Yes. Culturally, the people that, are, that, that take part in that would not, you know, they'll, they'll just live through it. It's like uh, the Amish. If, you know, if they're in a bad marriage, they just stay in it. Uh, and throughout most of history, that's been the way it's been. You know, you, you, you was picked for you. You're stuck with it. You know, it's really interesting you say that. <coughs> and I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about, I think I'm not talking about anyone here. Uh, maybe maybe I'll, I'll be corrected here in a second. But I, I've heard the argument in the past from older generations that the rise in divorce rate is actually somehow a sign of trouble in marriage, you know, some kind of cultural issue that we have here in America. And the rebut I always have to that is, yeah, because wives weren't allowed to, you know, own property or work or yeah, leave yeah. in past. I think you're right. So, I mean, I think that could be looked at as... 
as the opposite, that the rise in divorce is actually correlated to a rise in freedom of choice. Oh, absolutely. You know. I would agree. And, and so I think it's really interesting that, that as we look at our own rise in divorce rates, uh, some of the same people who would be aboard at the idea of uh, an arranged marriage because of, of the cultural restrictions would then uh, uh, laud the lower divorce rates when we had our own cultural restrictions here in the U.S. I just think that's a, an interesting kind of, okay. you know. I can see that. I can see that. But. 6% divorce rate in arranged marriages, by the way. That's a little too low. i got to agree with Mike now. I mean, that's well, a little... Well, and I think there's... I think there's definitely an element of that, but I, I think it is also low enough that it can't be just that. I think that's what it is. I think that I, I, that's, I'm that, sure that's, you think that's the that's only contributing I, factor to it. That's what I would expect it to be. Is that low? I would expect it to be somewhere six to ten percent, somewhere in that area. Just if, if you were just to ask me, I would have said ten percent. So, uh, and and again, that's just because I think it's a cultural reason. Um, <laughs> I just have a really hard time accepting anything that. Uh, where, where you're giving up your own choice, you're giving up your own uh, your, your own sovereignty. See, I was kind of leaning on Anna's side, and if I'd have heard the stat was like thirty percent, I'd have probably stayed there. But <coughs> hearing it's six percent, I, I kind of got to come to your side on this, Mike. I I, I think that can't be explained There's any other be a way. Reason. There's got to be you a know? reason. Um, I, I but think I, even... I will give you one thing, Anna. I do think that that sometimes an outside eye uh, can see things that, that others can't. What's why sometimes. You know, whenever you meet somebody, it's because your best friend goes, hey, you should date this guy. Mm -hmm. th th this guy and you would be great together. Well, and people enter into a, a semi-arranged si type situation all the time when they say, if you meet my best friend and they don't like you, we're done. Yeah. They are putting uh, romantic decisions in the hands of other people. Sure they are. We do that all the time. So we can't sit here and pretend like that is a completely foreign concept to I us. think it's a different thing, though. I do. Uh, I understand where you're coming from. I do, and I can even respect it, but I think, I think it's wrong. I don't, I don't agree with you. So. All right. Is there anything that I haven't covered in this? I in don't what? Know. I didn't do any research. So <laughs> the I, show. The, uh, thing the show we're doing. generally. I yeah. thought you might have meant arranged marriages. Okay. So anyway, um, well, the specific thing that uh, Thad wanted us to discuss was people who choose to be single. Um, oh, yeah. 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 So I do actually want to cover that a little bit here. Um, there are several different versions <coughs> of this. Um, first of which is probably what most people are going to be familiar with is celibacy. Um, culturally, especially in the U.S., we tend to associate that with people who have decided not to have sex. Um, however, traditionally celibacy, um, or I guess going back a little ways, celibacy was not so much just about not having sex, but also not entering into romantic relationships. Um, even further back than that, celibacy tended to mean for religious reasons, you're not going to be engaging in romantic relationships or sex. Um, these days, celibacy is much more about, um, or much less about re religion, um, and more just kind of a statement that, um, you know. And we're talking about voluntary celibacy here. I just want to yes. bring that out. Cause we've yeah. already done a show on, on, on involuntary, involuntary celibacy, the incel show. Yeah. Well, self-reported. Yeah, yeah. They were, yeah. yeah. They're voluntarily celibate <coughs> by some standards. Anyway, um, but that's beside the point. They're unhappily celibate for go, sure. Go listen to the incel show. Yeah. That was a good show. That was uh, a but popular anyway. show. Um, so celibacy largely, as I was saying, is about um, abstaining from uh, romantic relationships and sex. And typically people report that the reasons that they're doing this is to focus on uh, their careers, focus, focus on personal growth. Um, there's an element of it that seems to not necessarily be religious, but be sort of spiritual. Um, people say that they kind of help. I can see that. They're able to uh, focus themselves. They're able to kind of achieve a new level of calm that they weren't able to before. Um, Cold showers can do that, too. You know, uh, I can understand this because I, I, I've read some on this, the idea that, 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 that getting rid of your sexual urges uh, will, will, will make things simpler for you. Personally, I, I have problems with this because I couldn't focus on anything and I'm, I'm it's kind of a joke but I'm serious mm -hmm. there's a point when when celibacy 
will will make you fucking crazy. Yeah. Well, and it's really interesting because especially uh, one of the things that you hear a lot whenever you're kind of looking at people who practice this life and, and the stories that they're telling and everything, one of the things that you see a lot is comparisons to um, uh, drug detox. Because we do live in a hypersexual world. We do. Um, you, uh, from really early ages, we're asking our, our kids, you know, do you have a boyfriend? Do you have a girlfriend? You know, um, when our kids start dating, they're immediately talking about marriage and sex and everything like that. <coughs> every TV show um, that, that you look at, every movie just about is going to have some sort of sexual undertones, which is romantic I, relationships in them. Which is why I support locking your daughters up in a nunnery until they're 35. Um, anyway. <laughs> uh, and so... Uh, if you're not watching this on YouTube, you just missed a great shot from, 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 uh, from Anna there. So anyway. Um, so they, t- they kind of related a lot to like detoxing from drugs. So, you know, you spend a lot of time where sex is literally all that you're thinking about. Sure. Um, every, every time that somebody moderately attractive walks by you, you like want to just go convince them to get into bed with you. Absolutely. (laughs) Um, Absolutely. You know, you, You they tell me you outgrow that eventually. You get a boner every time you see a, remotely phallic symbol on TV or <laughs> remember the doilies com- remember the doilies comment on the show yeah um, doilies are <laughs> all over your house because you're trying to cover up anything that could be remotely sexual um, but no and so like with detoxing from drugs after a certain point you kind of Get over it. You're not craving it as much. Um, Now, obviously, we know with addiction that it's something that you fight every day. And a lot of people who are celibate say, you know, this is, they have to, in order to be successful, get into the celibate community and find people to be supportive with them um, and supporting them in their journey of being celibate. They uh, report things like not being able to be in relationships with people who are not celibate. Um, much like alcoholics will say they, they don't want to be in a relationship with sure, somebody who sure. drinks alcohol. I can completely it makes it understand that. Completely understand that. <laughs> um, so that's going to be, that's one type, a few other reasons. Any thoughts before I move on to sexual singledom? No, I mean, it, 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 it's it's something I, I don't really relate to. I mean, I agree with all the constituent parts of what you're saying that... Uh, Sex and, and endorphins are an addiction that humans have. But much the same way I agree that oxygen and, and water are addictions that humans have. And one might try and abstain from it and, and may even successfully do so for somewhere between three minutes and the rest of their life. Um, but Closer you know, to three minutes. Yeah. Well, that may be the rest of your life. It's there. That's, that's true. That's true. But, um, but, but no, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't. I I guess the thing I would have to empathize with in order to really uh, dive into them is the harm they feel from engaging their humanistic desires. Mm-hmm. You you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because I mean that that's one of the, the key things of addiction. It's not that you have some substance that you want. It's not that you you know like to eat celery every Thursday. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that this is causing you harm is why people abstain from the addiction. Well, yeah. m- maybe it is. Maybe it is. But there's also that idea that uh, I don't know if you've ever been in that situation where uh, you know you're training for something and you're going to cut out something in order to to to, to help yourself. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, you know, I, I think there's something there that focuses you as well. Yeah. And I can completely understand the the the, the desire to, you know, I need to I need to cut sex out of my life so I can focus on oh, this. Yeah. Well, and, and there's got to be something to it because we've seen it with with religious <laughs> sex. We've seen it with military sex at times. Mm-hmm. I don't. Uh, I've, I, I knew a boxer one time that wouldn't have sex if he was, well, was doing this say, because he, you know, you gotta you gotta have this. Uh, you know, you you gotta be focused. And we actually yeah. regularly see athletes engage in temporary celibacy. Well, you where you see it in movies. Before, I don't know if you really see it a lot, but uh, no, but, but probably it, it is reported um, by a lot of athletes that they will 
and there are a number of things that they're yeah, abstaining yeah. from. Some of them food related, some of them activity related. Keeps uh, you focused. You know, don't go skiing before a big match because you'll break your fucking leg or something yeah. like that. Um, but sex being one of them. Um, in fact, one of the things that a lot of people report is they start to realize how much energy they were putting into um, having and getting sex and that they suddenly have um, all of this free time. And I see you laughing over there. Um, Our producer's over there. I'm not going to say his name, but I think you're thinking about the amount of free time he would have if he just gave this up. Yeah. How much could he get accomplished? Man. He'd have like 72 more hours a week. (laughs) (laughs) But anyway, um, and so, you know, they find themselves um, learning a new language or um, getting better at you know, it's funny. performing we didn't a mention, particular musical instrument. Or we, didn't, we didn't mention we have a guest producer, so everybody thinks that's Alex. Alex, if you would it's only... It's Alex. It, yeah. it, it's not Alex, nor is it the child. So. <laughs> yes, it is not the child. No. Hey, 72 um. hours a week, that boy. <laughs> Uh, uh, but anyway, um, so they do report having a lot more time to sure. kind of focus on other things, <coughs> which is also something you see from people um, engaging in fasting. You know, when you're not it's worried. A good comparison. Yeah. When, well, yeah, actually. But, you know, when you're not you worried something about. something good, Anna. Fuck off. When you're not worried about cooking and She's sitting down today, for a meal you, I just and anything her. like that. Um, you know, you find that you have a lot more time to do other shit that you should have been doing. I think instead. about how much I could have accomplished in 1988 if I just would have, you know, abstained. Could have done something with your life. I could have done that something could've, with my life. You could have t- taken all that sex and focused more on the drugs. That's true. <laughs> That's true. That's true. I, I have uh, a feeling the drugs had a little bit to do with the sex. Yeah, okay. But you could or have vice versa. Acceptable. Acceptable. You could have gotten half as much and, and still gotten the. Yeah. So, moving on, um, and I think this is something that people will probably identify with a bit more um, and simultaneously have more problem with, um, but is sexual singledom. Yeah. Which I've not actually seen that phrase anywhere, but that's what I'm going to call it. Sexual singledom. Yes. What is it? So, it is deliberately choosing to be single, but not choosing to be sexless. (laughs) <laughs> oh, so 20. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh. Well, you know, it, it's, we had another name for that when I was a kid. It was called 20. It's real funny because, you know, we talked about this a lot in our in polygamy versus monogamy, but this has actually kind of become a societal loophole where, like, where polygamy is frowned upon, we say, hey, how about this? If we just don't commit. Then, then we, we can, can have a lot of partners, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that it, that's not polygamy. It's just that poly. Is, There's no gammy. Well, it's just yeah, poly. It was. It, it's not polyamory either. It's just no, you know twenties. It's you know. relationship anarchy. Yes, exactly. Relationship oh, anarchy. You haven't heard that one. Oh, that one's interesting. Uh, but <laughs> so stupid. Uh, but yeah, anyway. it, it seems to be the the monogamous loophole. Anarchy. I don't know that it is. Um, so what? A lot of the. Uh, sexually single express as the benefits are um, similar to that of celibate people. Um, And there have actually been a lot of studies done on, um, and and there's a a combination of sexually single and celibate um, in these studies, but there have actually been a lot of studies that have been done on um, the benefits or the, differences in activity levels of certain things between single people and married people of similar ages. Um, And the data seems to indicate that it is inarguably um, better to stay single, actually. Yeah. Um, So... I can see that. Depending on the study that you look at, some studies say that there, as far as happiness goes, is not a significant difference in happiness levels between single and married people. Um, other studies showing that uh, that single people are, on average, happier than married people. Um, the only place where it seems that um, married people come out ahead on on these particular studies 
tends to be in satisfaction levels, although I've actually seen some studies with it reversed. So some saying that married people are more satisfied than single people, um, and a few of them flipping that. I think probably on age ranges, but I don't actually remember the difference there. Um, hmm. So... Uh, I would guess about 50% of, uh, of, of people would be satisfied in their marriage. And I draw that from there's about a 50% divorce rate. Actually, they've done 35. studies. They, they've done studies that have indicated of the 50% that say together, one third report their marriage is happy. Really? Yeah. Hmm. I yeah. can see that. I can see that. Some people just stay together out of, out of habit and necess- yeah. necessity. Uh, so, for example, I, I understand. That's cool. Single people tend to be almost twice as social as married people. Um, spending approximately 13 minutes a day um, interacting with friends and family and staying in touch with people, whereas married people tend to spend about seven. Um, They have more time to be alone, which I guess if you're afraid of being alone or you don't like being alone, then you'd be happier with that stat as a married person. I love being alone. Right? Uh, They have more time for leisure um, because they're not trying to juggle two schedules and everything. Um, Leisure and time. Have, I remember that. Right? That was nice. Um, they report more annual personal growth, um, probably because they have more leisure time. They uh, travel more. They have more alone time. So with all of those combined. More career flexibility? Uh, yeah. Actually, yeah. interestingly, um, so single people tend to have uh, less uh, legal liability for obvious reasons, but also tend to have less credit card debt. Uh, single men work less than married men. Makes sense. Which I find really funny because there are two ways that you can take that. Or, or two, two ways that I took that when I read it. Was the first one, the funnier one, is of course they work more. They don't want to be home. Uh, they they want to be away from home. They don't want to be chained to their wife all the time. Um, speaking heteronormatively, of course. And then the other one being, well, of course they work more. They have a family to support. Whereas being single, you, all of your funds go toward yourself. And if you're making enough to sustain, then, you know, sustain and have some extra leisure time and some extra personal growth and yada yada, then, you know, why work more? Um, also, uh, oh, here was another one. It was interesting. Uh, this particular study noted that the difference wasn't significant but it was notable um that single women actually make more money than married women um for obvious reasons the expectation that married women are going to have kids and therefore need to take time off and be unreliable i think that's the whole glass ceiling argument yeah um and single people are tend to be healthier um because they dedicate more time to exercise gotta look good to pick up the women exactly um but, you just got to have the right beer. So I found all of that to be really interesting. Um, one, of, one of the things that was cited over and over again um, as why the fuck people would still bother to get married was um, having some stability. And then, of course, they're citing um, social acceptance as well. Um, there are over a thousand federal benefits incurred on or in give. Given allotted to married, yeah, yeah. Allotted to married people. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, there's serious social pressure there. Um, additionally, whenever we hear about the rise in um, people staying single, we hear about the um, rising rate of, or rising age of first marriages. Um, it's almost exclusively talked about in a negative, uh, a negative tone. Now, I have my own philosophical and political reasons for thinking that that's why it's portrayed that way. Um, but it is really interesting given the tone with which you hear all of this stuff and then looking at the research that's been done on it and seeing <coughs> that it seems like an illogical choice that people would get married. It seems like an illogical choice. I, 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 can, I can see that. I can see that. Yeah. I don't know that I agree, but I can see where the argument comes yeah. from. It, it seems as though one of the few areas 
that marriage makes sense is if you want to have kids. And economically, I think it, it, I think there's the, 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 the tax breaks and the security. And yeah. I think there's well, and and I think especially now that um, it's typical that both partners work, um, I think you do have a little bit of economic stability that you don't have otherwise. Yep, and if a single person loses their job, it is all on them to get a new one and and keep their lifestyle up. Whereas in a two income household, if one of them loses their job, there is at least some money still coming in. That's true. There's also the fact that that, that uh, while while divorce is easier now, a contract still provides a degree of security. It's still harder to leave yeah. than it is if you just go, fuck you, I'm out of here. Yeah. You know, uh, it, there, there's still a, a steps you have to take. So there's a bit of security to it. Yeah. And I understand that. I yeah. get it. I do too. Um, so. This was interesting. Um, and I, I, I'm, by the end of the show, I no longer want to kill you. So this is uh, better oh, than most episodes. Relationship anarchy is fucking nearly impossible to no, fucking define. is not nearly impossible. It is fucking ne- is very easy. Is nearly fucking impossible to define. Um, everybody that practices it for obvious reasons seems to define it differently. But by and large, it seems to consist a lot of not defining any of your relationships. So not using labels like boyfriend, girlfriend, uh, nesting partner, wife, husband, Um, Yes, I said nesting partner. It's a thing. Nesting partner. It's a polyamory thing, actually. Does it involve, like, like leaves and shit? It means the person you live with. I I, I don't even believe in defining anything. In fact, I don't use words more. I just tap on the mic. Don't Don't do that, John. Stop it. Stop it. (laughs) I just knocked it over. I'm sorry that he did that to you guys. Uh. Um, But anyway, so it's it's kind of hilarious. It, It seems to largely consist of people trying to buck not just the traditional system, but the... That was uh, buck with a B. But the other systems that have um, kind of derived from the primary system, um, just kind of saying, like, we we don't need labels. We don't need you guys to define us. Um, So much like political anarchy, it doesn't exist. Whatever. Yeah, I well, you that. know, I, I, I think there are two kinds of not defining things. And, and one is a ruse, and the other is a bad idea. <laughs> um, so we should try it. The ruse is saying, I don't need to define my relationship to you. Mm-hmm. But it's still defined within the confines of the relationship. You have an agreement, and, and, and you know, you just aren't telling anyone what it is. It's a secret. It's not undefined. You're just not telling people. The other one is truly not defining it, Right. But if you're truly not defining it, it means you're not having conversations about things that are acceptable within the relationship. Because once you start having those conversations and building those walls, you are defining it. For instance, uh, you, you, you take your, your girl on a nice date. You know, you, the evening goes well. You're going to take her home. And you're like, hey, by the way. I'm uh, totally going to, my roommate's waiting and we're both going to, we're all going to have fun tonight. It's, maybe that's not something that is acceptable to her. And if you aren't having a conversation where you're building definitions around what your relationship is, Mm -hmm. you're only going to lead yourself into a bad spot. Uh, So defining something isn't necessarily building rules or walls. It's a communication in which you're figuring out what things are. So either you are defining it. Is it rules but no rulers? Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no measuring devices in this relationship. <laughs> yeah, only rules. <laughs> yes, um, and and if we have anybody in the audience practicing relationship anarchy, I would actually like to kind of hear from them. Um, I'd be fascinated. But one of the things that it, it one of the ways in which it seems to differ drastically from polyamory, because um, polyamory seems to have a significant element of defining all of the relationships that you engage in, whereas, and, and being open and honest, um, with anybody that you're engaged with about the nature of your relationship with them, as well as the other relationships so that everybody can be fully informed and ethically non-monogamous. Um, whereas with relationship anarchy, it was tough to kind of find in many places, but it seemed like in not defining 
the relationships that you're having, it would be a lot less prone to that openness and honestness um, of, yes, I'm fucking you and four other people. Um, I have this primary person um, that I live with and, you know, we can expect to be casual, have a good time, but nothing as serious is going to come of this. Whereas with relationship anarchy, I think it would be easier to fall into a, a kind of pattern of radio silence about what is going on. And I could see there being some risk to that. That was like an oddly specific example. His name's Roy. And the other one's Jerry. They, they both live on, on Commerce Street down here. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Well, this was interesting, guys. I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a, I've got some things to think about here. Uh, it's going to hurt. Is it? Yeah, thinking always hurts me. I know. I'm kind of slow. It's okay. So did we cover everything? We love I you hope so. Oh, Lord. It's about time. Yeah. Hey, if somebody wanted to purchase some swag from us, John, where could they, where could they go to do that? Come to my house, you know, three <laughs> times. Uh, no, if you don't want to do all that, you can go to uh, teespring.com, search Six Pack Philosophy. We have our swag up there, and you can order right on the interwebs, and they ship to your house. Yeah, yeah, cool stuff. We got shirts. We got... Uh, uh, whatever the canvases, hell that is. Coffee canvases, cups. coffee cups, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And if they want to support the show, uh, how could they do that? Best way to do that is patreon.com slash six pack philosophy. And not only can you or support just give me access to your bank account, not only can you support show the show, I know. you can get special listener perks that other people don't get. You yes. can be special, you could be just the, like everyone else. You could sleep with me if you wanted to, but in a different way. I'm just saying that, that that's on there, that's an option. 500 bucks, baby. 500 bucks. He'll do it for free if you just show up <laughs> and bring the right beer. You just got to listen to a few well, shows. You can know which one. Bring Rolling are. Rock. You're fine. You're set. You're set. Yeah. Uh, anyway, spit in his mouth. He's 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 easy. Takes more than that. Yeah. <laughs> Takes more than that. Uh, anyway, um, I've just been insulted. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We've had fun, kind of, and we hope you have too. Cheers. Cheers. Six Pack Philosophy is supported by independent philosophers just like you. If you would like to support us, go to sixpackphilosophy.com and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. 